sabe que educação se dá na presença. E de uma hora para outra, esse lugar tão especial do aprendizado teve que mudar. Em tempos de mudança, é muito importante lembrar que estamos juntos. e a colaboração são ainda mais importantes para a gente seguir construindo futuros mais brilhantes. É sobre isso Cambridge Day 2020, colaboração em tempos de mudança. Nosso evento sempre foi um momento de encontro, celebração e aprendizado. Esse ano seguiremos juntos, ao vivo, com palestrantes do mundo todo, cada um na sua própria casa. Então nós temos um encontro marcado dos dias 20 a 24 de julho. Inscreva-se em cambridgeday.org.br. Vem com a gente construir mais um Cambridge Day. Hi everyone, welcome to Cambridge Day 2020. My name is Renata Simões and I'll be with you during this week. Hi everyone, welcome to Cambridge Day 2020. My name is Renata Simões and I'll be with you during When we are going to learn and share content, experience, and research, I take out my headphones because it was giving me two, two signs of uh, As you know, we are all talking from our homes, me included, uh, because this is the annual event promoter to by Cambridge University Press, focus on English uh, language teaching professionals. And due to a very particular experience we are all sharing this year, Not only Cambridge Day is happening online, but also we are connecting Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, and other Latin American countries or elsewhere in the world together in this event. So please, uh, if you want to say hi to us on our chat, tell, tell us from where you are seeing this event, no matter where you are joining us. I think it is possible to show us, not only possible, but it's important for us to know that you appreciate, uh, to know your thoughts and appreciation from what you're thinking about Cambridge Day 2020. Either leave your comments and questions on your social media channels or on our social media channels, just tag Cambridge Brazil on your posts and stories. And to open this moment, I have João Madureira, Latin American South Director of Cambridge Press, ELT. So nice to have you here, João. How are you today? Farrell, thank you very much, Renata, and uh, welcome you all to the Cambridge Days uh, 2020. Uh, we are very excited with this uh, technology and the ability to speak to a lot of people at the same time, uh, not only around Brazil, but around Latin America and, and uh, perhaps even around the world. I've heard that there are people from uh, other parts of the globe. So welcome you all. Thank you. No, it's amazing. In a way, despite the this awkward moment we are living, it's amazing to have so many people together here. So one of the things that uh, maybe the main model is like collaboration in times of change. Which thought orientated uh, Cambridge University Press to this year's event and what's the importance of keeping it uh, in a tough moment like this one? Could you tell us? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's an awful moment uh, globally, but uh, we have to take the uh, positive side. We have to take the good things that uh, such situation can uh, bring and often bring to us opportunities to uh, change models, opportunities to uh, see the world from a different perspective. However, the essence of uh, the Cambridge days uh, has, have always been uh, to offer the teachers Uh, the support from our organization, but not the support only in terms of uh, supporting the products and the contents we provide, but also supporting the people. And uh, it's about people. Education is about people. And uh, our aim, obviously, is to keep in touch uh, with the people who are the reason why uh, we exist as a company and as professionals working uh, with Cambridge University Press. Yeah, I think when you're talking about people, you're also talking about education, right? And we are very glad to begin our journey together. We have a journey of five days we're spending together this week. Uh, any more thoughts, Joan, that you want to leave and share with us before we start our, our day? 
Absolutely. Uh, as you said, education is about people. And despite the moment uh, and the fact that we are, we have been using the term social distancing uh, to reflect actually a physical distance from people. Uh, we, we don't necessarily need to be socially distant because we can still talk on the phone as old as the phone may seem. Uh, we can interact on the internet, we can do WhatsApp, we can do Facebook, we can do Twitter. So uh, I, don't, I don't like using social distancing. I like physical distancing because that's what's happening at the moment and will soon be over. Uh, so it is important to, to uh, stress that uh, we may be physically distant, but we are very, very close in our thoughts and our concerns with everyone that works with us. Thank you very much. Yes, we're still connected in. Yes, I'm the, the kind of person who talks on the phone too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joao. Well, well uh, each day uh, has itself on its primary focus and, and all of them, uh, how can I say, uh, we have a remaining question. How do you guide students into the exciting journey of learning a second language? Which are the main obstacles uh, in a teacher's routine and what are the new ones you guys are facing this right now? Uh, you want to talk anything else about us or can I, can I go? No, I just I just quickly want to talk a little bit about the history of the Cambridge days because uh, this is, I think it's important because today is a turning point uh, in the way we deliver the Cambridge days. So if you, if you allow me another minute or so. Uh, please, just, please, no. <laughs> I just want to remember uh, people that uh, the, the Cambridge days was a, a, an idea that started 19 years ago. And uh, over these close to 20 years, 19 years, uh, we have tried and we have done different models. Uh, we have gone from uh, uh, being a, a teacher training, uh, a presentation of Cambridge products to a teacher development uh, uh, format, uh, an event that uh, we bring people together so that uh, we can share ideas, we can share experience, we can get closer to our customers, we can get our customers get closer to each other. Uh, we could uh, talk to them and hear them before we would just uh, be around the, the next visit to show a, a new series, a new content, a new book. So uh, the idea behind the Cambridge Days was always to be uh, interactive. It was always to be closer to our customers uh, in a way that uh, we could hear them before they would hear us. Uh, and um, it, it, it is perhaps not a coincidence uh, coincidence, but uh, to this date today, Cambridge University Press celebrates 486 years. And despite being so old in terms of years, uh, we are all feeling uh, a little bit like a teenager, you know, just about to discover the world again, uh, using this wonderful opportunity that technology has brought to us, which means that uh, we can speak to a great uh, group of people, to a great audience of old and new friends that are around Brazil, around Latin America South, uh, and, and, and the world. And uh, so we, we, we're feeling very excited, despite our 486 uh, years of history. Uh, and before I move back to you, I just want a very quick uh, thank you to all, all of our sponsors that has, uh, have made, uh, made this possible at this moment. Uh, the agents that is uh, helping us with technology, with putting together the event. Our dear MC, the Master of Ceremonies, thank you for joining for this particular celebration today and this week. Uh, indeed, our IT staff that is on call uh, to make sure that uh, the connections and the systems and platforms are in, in good use. Uh, and a big, big thank you to all of the people watching us at the moment around the world uh, for joining us and for spending time with us. Uh, please enjoy the event and we hope to see you throughout this week. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joan, for your kind words, for reminding us that uh, we are celebrating an, an anniversary and to, uh, how can I say, provide us the ability of being together at this event. We be, I'm going to come back a little bit, how can I say, in my, in my speech and say to you guys, thank you for being here. We begin today the journey of five days we are spending together. Uh, each day has itself its primary focus, and on all of them, we have this remaining question, how do you guide students into the exciting journey of learning a second language? Uh, which are the main obstacles and the main challenge in a teacher's routines, and which are the new ones they will face now? On our first webinar, See when I have uh, sometimes my phone are not working, my airports are not working as it's supposed to. But uh, to come now to our first webinar, it is related to how can I say emotional and co cognitive engagement uh, to the learning process. So to talk about this, one of the top course and resource resource book uh, writers of Cambridge University Press is here, Dr. Herbert Puka. He has carried out the research. Uh, the research into the practical application of findings from co cognitive psychology and brain research to the teaching of English as a second language, uh, as a foreign language, actually. He usually comes to Brazil once every two years, and he did not last, come last year, so we are supposed to receive him his, this year, but unfortunately. So for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet him, and for those of you who already know his face, we produce a small video introducing our first speaker and it will be shown here for the first time now. Hello, good afternoon. I am a course book writer, but my wonderful books, the best books in the world, they're actually mine. They don't teach. The relationships we manage to create, they are more important than materials. Stories are more than just fun. Stories need to engage the child emotionally by helping them to understand the world and their world experiences. Getting students to learn with each other and to learn from one another. Look, I'm the eternal optimist, okay? The only source for my optimism is actually that I'm in education. This is actually the contribution we are making towards a better world of tomorrow. Hello, Renata. Oh, hello, Herbert. How are you? So nice to have with you here with us. And thanks for joining us. I think it's beginning of the evening there in Austria, right? Uh, yeah, it's early evening uh, still. I may have to switch on the light at one point during the session. <laughs> we'll see how it, <laughs> how it goes. It's the live event we are all living in. And how are things there? Are students already back at in school? Which uh, was, uh, I think, that you... What the main challenge the teachers faced during this quarantine period there in Austria? Um, yes, I mean, like in many countries around the world, our, our schools were uh, locked down for some time. Uh, they are now on their uh, summer holiday. You know, it's summer here in, in, in Austria at the moment. So they have nine weeks of their holidays and everybody is hoping, especially the parents, that <laughs> can go back to school as from as from September. Yeah, I think that we all face in challenge and difficulties, but also uh, rethink in the way we live and we teach. So, please, uh, could you uh, share with us, share with all the ELTs 
teachers that are waiting for your thoughts and words. A little bit of this teaching English online, what the principles, what the, your reflections and propositions on it. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I would, uh, first of all, <laughs> like to, to thank you and, and the team at um, Bella Baderna um, for all the technical support they, they have given me already. I'd like to thank Joao. I saw him uh, briefly there when you introduced him, he had an amazing headset or headset on. It's fantastic to see. I'm excited. There are so many people joining us today. And, and I'm hoping that um, some of the ideas that I'm going to share uh, with you now uh, will actually meet your expectations. And I'm hoping you can actually use them yourself in your uh, classrooms. I'll now switch over. So we can um, see my talk. Give me a moment. One minute before, while you're switching over, uh, <laughs> there are two comments on our chat that I must share with you. First of all, it's Mariana Rodriguez saying, nine week break, that's the dream I had in my life. <laughs> and a lot of people cheering you, not only from Brazil, but also from uh, the whole South America and Latin America. Hello, Herbert. Hello, Mr. Puja. Nice to have you here. Again, so please enjoy yourself, have fun. That's <laughs> lovely, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm going back to the screen sharing now, and I hope this is gonna work. Exciting technology. Okay, lovely. So, uh, let me start by saying that I'd love to be with you for a Cambridge day in, in Sao Paulo, actually, and I was in Brazil also last year, and I normally, um, as many of you know, come to Brazil uh, once a year. But of course, this year it's it's absolutely impossible. And I'm I'm really really happy that we can meet um, online. I'd like to welcome you most warmly to this session, and um, I'm happy you've turned out in such uh, great numbers. Um, today I'm going to be to be talking about. Um, some of the PPPs of, of um, teaching online. The principles, I'm going to share with you some personal uh, reflections. Actually, I'd like to switch to the next um, slide, but this is, oh yeah. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the, the principles of emotional and cognitive engagement. I'm going to uh, reflect on some personal experiences I've made with uh, teaching online a group of uh, nine-year-olds here in Austria. I'll tell you um, uh, some anecdotes about that and I'll share some of my uh, key reflections. And I will um, finally, after sharing with you a number of um, teaching tips um, for teaching online, most of which I have actually developed while uh, going through this uh, experience myself. And finally, I will summarize my own um, personal experiences with working with primary kids and I will, in all the suggestions I make, also consider the teenage classroom because I think that uh, the, the principles of what I'm talking about are applicable to any teenage classroom. Um, and last but not least, I will share, as I've said, um, some uh, propositions um, uh, in answer to two questions, basically, how we can enrich um, our teaching methodology that is currently widely used, um, uh, the online teaching methodology, how we can um, you know, have more variation and maybe um, activate uh, learners more uh, through the uh, technology we use, the, the methodology we use. And then um, uh, last but not least, how we can uh, create also a meaningful link between what we are doing now in a lockdown situation and what uh, we will do in, in a future uh, classroom uh, situation again. Okay, so let's start with the principles of emotional and, and cognitive um, engagement. 
Um, there are actually uh, three principles of emotional and cognitive engagement. And uh, some of you have heard me uh, talk about uh, emotional and cognitive engagement before, so I'll be very brief in this, in this introduction. But what are the three key principles of engaging our students? Well, the first thing, and this is what I have personally learned from uh, James uh, Zal, the neurobiologist, one of the leading uh, minds when it comes to understanding um, uh, learning processes, um, looking at learning processes through the filter of um, cognitive biology of um, uh, brain research. So the first aspect here is that um, if we want to engage students emotionally and cognitively, we need to know that the brain uh, is concerned with um, our survival, which means that uh, the brain wants to learn, the brain is curious about learning new things, the brain wants to understand more, but it only wants to learn and understand things that the brain thinks are relevant for our own future. So this is a huge uh, point for us as teachers because we actually need to engage them in a kind of learning that our learners will see as uh, relevant. I think this is particularly important now in the lockdown situation. Um, if students have to do um, kilos of worksheets where they uh, merely um, do fill-in activities, then there is the danger that students might not see this as relevant for their own future. And then we have a problem. Let me share a little cartoon here. Some of you may have uh, seen this. It's a Gary Larson cartoon. Uh, uh, it's, it's a two-part um, cartoon. In the first uh, image here, we see the dog owner talking to his dog. And he says, okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage or else. And in the second image, we have what they hear, what the dogs hear. And it goes, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, blah, blah. So, the only thing, and this is why this cartoon, it's so relevant for what we do in the classroom. The only thing the dog remembers here is its name, Ginger. So metaphorically speaking, we need to get more Ginger into our classrooms. Uh, we need to get more relevant um, content and processes into our classrooms processes and content that are perceived as relevant by our students so they will be engaged more cognitively and emotionally um, secondly um, we are talking um, key principles of emotional engagement and cognitive engagement and emotional engagement and these have to do number two with progress and movement. Our students need to have a sense of learning. They need to know they're making progress. Um, otherwise, uh, they will be frustrated with their learning uh, process. So progress is, of course, intimately tied up with movement. Um, it means moving from um, a low level to gradually uh, a higher level, etc., etc., etc. So we have constant movement in the learning process, and we need to do everything we can to give um, learners a sense of this progress. Um, progress is also about movement. I've said this. Uh, everybody who teaches young learners knows this, of course, and it's about anticipated movement. What does that mean? Well. If you think of um, you getting your students to read a piece of text, or if you watch a video together with them, or if you uh, are an avid reader and it's one o'clock in the morning and you can't put that book down, well, 
we are sitting still when we do this, when we watch a movie, when we read a piece of text, when we listen to something interesting, uh, when we read a novel, we are not moving, we are sitting still. But the story goes somewhere. And we are totally engaged in finding out where the story goes. This is the secret of a reading, good, relevant reading process and of watching a movie. We want to know where the story goes. We're constantly predicting and anticipating. And if the story goes in the desired direction, we will be happy. If it doesn't, we'll be disappointed or sad or what have you. So this is the emotional um, engagement that we get uh, from anticipated movement. Um, this, of course, brings us to success because uh, progress is about success, isn't it? And I'd like to share two um, um, quotes with you. The first one uh, is by Earl Stevig. Many of you know this, but it's so important to constantly remind us of this. Success in the foreign language class depends less on materials uh, techniques and linguistic analysis and more on what goes on uh, inside and between the people in the classroom. So obviously Earl Stevig is not saying that the materials are not important and he's not saying that our own um, technological skills are not important. But what he's saying is that there are some uh, covered um, processes um, processes that happen below the surface of learning, so to speak, and they are covered. They are psychological processes. They are about how engaged um, uh, students are. And the other um, aspect is that, um, of course, uh, this has been raised by other people too. I'd like to to uh, share a second quotation here with you. Uh, success um, is no accident. It's hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, a sacrifice, and most of all, love of what you're doing or learning uh, to do. Now, again, this quotation stresses the importance of um, cognitive engagement, the learning, the studying aspect. It um, stresses the fact that learning is not is no accident. Our, we need to, to get passion from our students. We need to get this engagement from our students. And this beautiful part of the uh, quotation here, learning is about the highest of all possible, possible emotions. It's about love. This is the, the strongest motivation one can, can, can have. And my um, um, request now to the Brazilians is, can you guess who actually said this beautiful quotation, who it is from? Can you write it in your, in your chat box, please? Ah, okay. You know it all, of course. Okay. So uh, this is um, your your famous um, uh, son trying to go back to the other. Um, no, trying to go back to the other um, presentation. Yes, your famous son um, Pele. Absolutely. Okay. Now. Um, both of these quotations stress the importance of, of linking cognition, thinking with emotions. And um, this is a fascinating aspect of learning. For a long time, for thousands of years actually, there has been a belief that these are two things, one of which the emotional side of it is less important. Here is a quotation that comes from, from Aristotle, who says that human reason is the most godlike part of human nature. A life guided by human reason is superior to any other. For man, this is the life of reason, 
since the faculty of reason is the distinguishing characteristic of human beings. Okay. Um, a fascinating quotation because if you look at what um, neurobiologists have come up with, they say the, the complete opposite. What they say is that many myths exist about emotions, and one of which is that emotions are irrational and don't depend on thinking and reasoning. Actually, Lazarus and Lazarus say emotions and intelligence go hand in hand, which is why humans, highly intelligent beings, are such emotional animals. Lazarus and Lazarus, two uh, neurobiologists. Uh, and um, last but not least, um, we have the, the third point here, which is about ownership and control. So we have these three principles, understanding relevance, progress and movement, anticipated movement also. And finally, ownership and control. Uh, many people, when they hear the word ownership, they do not immediately make the connection with, with learning because they think of ownership as um, something that is connected to owning material things. But of course, we also own our language. We own what we produce with our language. Copyright is an aspect of this ownership of language. And control um, is another, so, uh, another aspect that is so important. So um, uh, James uh, Zal, who I learned uh, a lot about neurobiology from, says, no outside influence or force can cause a brain to learn. It'll decide on its own. Thus, one important rule for helping people learn is to help the learner feel they are in control. And I think that's a very, very important aspect. And this is probably one of the most difficult and challenging aspects uh, for us when we are not together with our learners in a physical environment. When our learners are in front of their screens at home and we cannot really help them so well to give them a feeling of having this ownership and this control immediately. So I think it's, it's something that, that we really need to work on as teachers. Um, I'm going to, to share with you now um, uh, some of my, my personal experiences, as I said, um, I have actually been involved in some, some um, uh, personal online teaching with a group of uh, nine-year-olds. So, so what I'm going to talk about here is, is um, uh, about two and a half years ago, my grandson started going to, to school here in Austria, in a little village in the middle of nowhere. That's where I live too. Uh, actually, I have a, a photo of this, uh, hang on, of this um, village here. As you can see, uh, the middle of nowhere, the, the school is somewhere here in the middle of nowhere. And um, so uh, the, the, when, my, when my grandson started to go to school there, I decided to come up with um, um, an offer that I made to the school. I would teach my grandson's class English um, for free if the school would allow me to work with those kids three hours a week instead of the usual one, which sadly is what Austrian state primary schools normally provide. Uh, we'll probably all agree that three hours a week is not a lot. But it's a lot better than one hour. Anyway, my proposal was accepted and I've been teaching this class for three years now, enjoying every minute of what has been an exciting learning experience for me. I hope for the children too, at least sometimes. Well, looking back four months, 
it was four months now when when the big crisis started wasn't it i remember that communicating in about and in and about english with those kids wasn't only fun for them and me but most satisfying they seemed to love the lessons these are by the way not real photos they are agency photos because you know one has to be so careful these days with with copyright um, so I've just used um, agency photos here. Um, so you know we had we had all the fun of the world. They seemed to love the lessons. Their level in all skills was remarkably high, given I only taught them three hours a week. And what's more, I kept getting quite a lot of unsolicited but very positive feedback from the parents. And then out of the blue, everything changed okay because as you know of a virus and as you also know this is not the beginning of a dystopian novel but the reality that we've all gone through in some way or another while my recent classroom experience may not be um, uh, very very different from uh, yours um, what we do have in common, or it may actually be very different from yours, sorry. What we do have in common is that the corona-induced um, changes and the need to move the teaching and learning from the um, classroom to an online, to a home learning situation has been a surprising or even shocking reality for us. There is another point I'd like you to consider. If what I've said above had indeed come from a dystopian novel, the school lockdown could easily have been the turning point at which the teaching of English was basically taken over by computers. In such a dystopian scenario, algorithms would have been used to develop resources and activities and the needs of every single learner would have been met. The pandemic scenario would have been balanced in some way through mountains of data available on a global scale. And that's why the success of these so-called adaptive learning programs would have been a given. But this, of course, is where the dream or the nightmare, uh, however you want to see it, ends. Let's not forget that several years ago, some people and some publishers had already claimed that adaptive learning systems were basically ready to enrich our teaching and raise the efficacy of students' learning to new heights. But interestingly, although now is a time when those algorithms could be invaluable if they were actually able to do what was promised, they have not surfaced. They've left us in peace. This raises the question, of course, if they really were able to do what was promised, why have we not seen them? Well, far from it, in fact. In this current situation, it's clear that educational managers, school owners, Ministerial decision makers and parents have understood or rediscovered how important good teaching is and how important good teachers are. And what I said kind of jokingly uh, to Henata at the beginning of this session is actually not a joke. In Europe, uh, where in their long summer holidays, um, children, uh, you know, um, are away from school. Parents are all crossing fingers and saying, I hope my child will be able to go back to a normal school life as from um, uh, September. So many people, I think, have rediscovered uh, how important good teachers are. Many colleagues around the world who feel passionate about teaching and who wouldn't want to work as anything other than a teacher have also rediscovered something they've known for some time. 
and frequently applied in their classrooms or have at least realized intuitively and communicated unconsciously to their students that in order to teach children and teenagers successfully whether online or in classrooms we often find that the passion we feel for teaching kindles a passion in the learner for learning so that what follows is full engagement the sense of progress and the joy of being able to interact with others in and through a new language very much um, in line with a famous uh, quotation that comes from um, wb yates education is not the filling of a pail but the lighting of a fire and this is where the journey started for myself as a teacher of that group of nine-year-olds i discovered pretty early in my own career that we always need to bear in mind that a classroom is not a kind of a filling station where the teacher actually fills the um, students brains um, empty brains with knowledge or in our case with language it's in many ways what Vygotsky calls a zone of proximal development or if you are in a classroom with i don't know how many students it's actually a case of proximal um, development and um, uh, in this uh, zone of, of um, proximal development um, the teacher is confident that what learners can do with help from the teacher today they'll be able uh, to do independently without help tomorrow um, adding to that the venerable uh, linguist uh, Gordon Wells makes the point that uh, whenever people collaborate in an activity each can assist the others and each can learn from the contributions of the others so what these two quotations have in common is the the um, um, focus on um, learning as a social um, process where the teacher guides students in this um, uh, process of um, acquiring different uh, zones of proximal uh, development and and learners learn not only from the teacher the teacher also learns from the learners and the the children and the teenagers at the same time also learn from each other this is a this is a key point so as i i promised at the beginning i i was gonna uh, offer to you a number of um, online of of teaching tips for teaching online and the first one is actually make sure students get enough opportunities uh, to collaborate. Uh, this is, of course, um, something that, that doesn't seem very logical at the moment because we have our student learning at home. And I'm saying here, make sure they can collaborate as often as possible. If we have our students in uh, the classroom, this is what we have. We have um, a teacher giving uh, instructions to learners or uh, doing some some housekeeping stuff and and um, I don't know telling stories uh, explaining tasks clarifying language etc 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 all this is is of course um, extremely important and we need that online as well but then we also of course have um, and that's very easy to establish in a classroom uh, pair work activities uh, we we only need as this this uh, diagram shows we only need to get students to turn to one another in the classroom and we can engage them in pair work online this is a little more difficult of course uh, but i think we need some kind of um, 
learners working with one another too. And here, um, I think uh, that's what my own experience has been, and that's something I'd like to warmly recommend. We need to, to get a little bit of help from our friends, the students' parents. We need to help them, especially when we're teaching um, young learners, we need to help them to set up pair work tasks. So what I um, uh, did with my learners, I gave them um, uh, pair work uh, tasks. I established um, um, a, what I call a buddy learning system where I asked the parents to arrange for their child to meet up online, for example, on Skype, on Facebook or what have you, uh, or on FaceTime. Uh, and they were FaceTime, I meant, sorry. And they uh, were working on these tasks um, uh, together um, as learning buddies. We need parents for that when you work with uh, uh, children. They need to help us create learning buddies. Uh, they need to show an interest, but we don't want them to judge, of course. And, and that's why we need to keep our parents informed and we need to keep good rapport with them. The, the only good thing about the lockdown situation for me has been that parents were locked down as well. So parents um, uh, had a great interest in, in their child's uh, uh, learning progress. And um, so this made uh, the whole thing much easier. I suppose I have given these tips to a number of um, teenage um, uh, teachers of teenagers also, and they said it worked very well there because, of course, teenagers are very savvy when it comes to, um, I don't know, working with, with uh, uh, phones or, or online uh, materials. Um, I'll just quickly switch the lights on so you won't see me for a second. I'm back. Um, what can be done by these learning bodies? Well, they can engage in in lexical uh, learning, they can. Um, um, sorry, I've I've actually. Uh, no, it's still here. Sorry, sorry, sorry about this. Um, we can get them to do reading uh, individually, but then work on reading tasks together, um, as well as listening tasks. We can uh, get them to write together. We can get them to write individually, but then uh, read their texts to each other, we can engage them in speaking activities, and we can help them to uh, learn uh, body testing. That is something that is very, very uh, important. We know from um, research that um, the most efficient way of preparing for tests is actually um, uh, practice testing and doing the same kind of test again and again and again and then a new practice test and if students if and when students do this in pairs this is something that um, can actually uh, work um, extremely well apologies for having um, a bit of a technical challenge here at the moment um, okay yes no, I think it's I think it's okay again now, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that's um, the, the the speaking buddy uh, system, if you like. Uh, the next tip is about arranging students in speaking groups. Um, I have quite a large number of students in my um, uh, class. Actually, um, um, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I have actually um, 10, uh, 24 students in my class. So I have divided them up into three uh, speaking groups and I work online uh, with, the, with these speaking groups. Um, what I do with them is, is, is obvious. This is the time when this is where I do um, uh, specific routines with them, such as, um, hope we can see the next slide now, small talk. Um, so the routine would start with a small talk, such as 
um, asking them how they are, uh, <laughs> little things, uh, you know, like what they did this morning before the before the the online learning session, what they had for breakfast, what activity um, uh, they spent most of their time uh, doing, etc., etc., etc. All kinds of of uh, uh, small talk uh, tasks. Then usually one or two speaking activities for example, from their course book, and then engaging them in a bit of self-reflection. Uh, what did you learn today? Was it easy? Was it tricky? Etc. 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 Okay, so those are the um, um, speaking uh, tasks. And before we go into this, uh, I'd actually like to tell you a little, if I can, pick it up here. Okay, good, fine. Um, uh, yeah, another thing I wanted to say, um, if your program has a chat box, use it as a board. Otherwise, have some pieces of cardboard ready or paper and a felt tip so you can write down prompts when you are with them on, on, on Zoom or, or another uh, platform uh, to support the, the speaking, to give them lexical chunks and prompts um, that that help them. My next point would be to encourage them to produce short videos of presentations we we uh, they they can give. So this is where I must once again crave your indulgence for a moment for me to tell you more about my experience as a proud um, granddad. Um, when I was explaining. Uh, to the kids that I would like them to do short videos. Um, ah, I have I have forgotten. I have to I have to tell you something else. When I started um, um, teaching English uh, to my grandson, when I knew I was going to teach my grandson, I had a little problem um, because my my grandson has actually um, been calling me Herbie rather than Grandpa since he's been able to speak. It's probably because some of my friends, like, like Jeff Strax and others, jokingly call me Herbie when we meet and when we work. So he heard that. And from that time on, he refused to call me grandpa. So I thought, well, this is not too good. If, if I'm the teacher and I'm teaching him in his class and he calls me Herbie. So I said to him, look, when I'm teaching you as from, from September, he was, um, six years old, you cannot call me Herbie. And he was very surprised. He said, what shall I call you? And I said, well, you know, like all the other kids um, that have learned English from me in Austria, you need to call me Mr. Puchta. And he, he quite liked the idea. And so he calls me uh, Mr. Puchta now, okay? So anyway, I was explaining to my students um, in a, in a uh, whole class um, session. So I had them on Zoom and I explained to them that I would like them to do short videos of themselves presenting something. So I call these at-home video stories. Uh, my favorite toys, my room, I'm having breakfast, etc., which they produce with their um, uh, phones, okay? And this is where my grandson interrupted me. Um, and he said, actually, um, uh, Mr. Puchter, can I make an unboxing video? And I have no idea how familiar you are with the current YouTuber style genres. Well, I didn't have the foggiest idea, of course, of what he was talking about, okay? An unboxing video. Um, to cut a long story short, this is how Wikipedia explains it. Unboxing is the unpacking of products, especially high-tech consumer products, where the process is captured on video and uploaded to the internet. The item is then also explained in detail and also can sometimes be demonstrated as well. Anyway, so my grandson came up with a glorious idea that um, he would he would want he wanted to produce an unboxing uh, video anyway 
So one day he was ready and he sent it to me from his phone. And when I looked at this, I was just so surprised because <laughs> um, it was really awesome. And awesome, by the way, is a word he used at least six times while unboxing his dad's smartphone and his laptop. But I was really gobsmacked, not just by the quality of his presentation, but in particular by the, by the breadth, the depth, and the accuracy of his English. It was really fascinating. And that's how I found out that when he watches YouTube clips, uh, his absolute favorites are unboxing videos. Until that point, I thought his English was so good because he had me as a teacher and he had learned from me exclusively. This just goes to show that um, learning can be achieved by listening to favorite content. And this is so important, obviously, uh, for him. Um, I, I think I reflected a lot about this, you know, the popularity of these videos may be something to do with recreating the delight of unwrapping a Christmas present or a birthday present or what have you. So anyway, we're coming almost to the end now. I'd just like to share, um, first of all, a few um, of my further um, online uh, teaching tips. This one is when working with speaking groups, interruptions have a president. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, let me just uh, quickly uh, explain to you. Um, when working with the, the speaking groups, you know, um, if somebody has something urgent to say or if something happens, uh, this can take, as Ruth Kohn says, the energy of a group away. So, sorry, this has actually jumped to the next slide. No, here we go. This direction. Um, so, um, what, what kinds of, of interruptions have we had? You know, I mean, we've had a cat's tail wagging in front of one child's um, uh, uh, camera, which was followed up, as you can imagine, by an impromptu, enthusiastic discussion about cats. Children wanted to learn the name of the cat, etc. how old the cat is, etc., etc. And then others um, told stories about their cats and, and other pets. We've been interrupted by a baby starting to cry. It actually turned out the baby was two weeks old. Um, it was a pupil's baby brother. And of course, when the others heard that, they almost shouted, can we see your brother? And to their delight, the, the pupil's mother appeared and showed us the newborn baby. It was a delightful um, uh, experience. Um, I, I just like to carry on with a few of my other uh, tips. I use an online clock to challenge the kids how long they manage to, to talk for uh, without using their own language. I use a glass jar, which I have next to me, looks a bit like this, that I actually um, use as a special um, uh, motivator. So when students say something nice, when they say something that others, uh, that makes others laugh, I drop a pebble in this uh, jar. My next uh, short tip, brief tip is have eye contact with your camera, not with your students. So that's something I had to learn. Of course, we all want to have eye contact with our kids. So if you're working with even a small group, like four kids, I, I usually work with larger groups, um, you want to have um, eye contact with them. But if I want to have eye contact with the girl down here on the right, there's no point looking at the girl's eyes. Uh, so if I look down here, I will actually seen from her point of view, not have eye contact with her. Okay, where I do need to look is up at the 
um, camera, then um, uh, she will see me having eye contact um, with her. And one other point, um, uh, this has to do with, with this, these four images here. Um, if I, we had a little more time, I could ask you now, which of these children? So my suggestion is observe their eye movement all the time. My suggestion here is, um, you know, which of these four children would actually worry you a bit in terms of attention? And it's, of course, the student in the lower uh, left. And I've made the, <laughs> I've made the experience that uh, when I ask a student like this boy, let's call him Tom, what are you looking at down there? In 70% of all the cases, the, the kid has their, I, their, their phone down there, okay? So ask them to switch their, their um, um, phones to flight mood, mode. And now, uh, last but not least, my propositions, which I would like to first of all, based on a summary of my own experiences of teaching online, I think it can really work well. For some of my students, it worked um, uh, very well. They made a giant leap forward um, in terms of their language development, but also in terms of learning to learn, in terms of their learner independence. That's uh, as I said in one of my slides, a key aspect. We cannot uh, expect them to make um, um, any progress in their learning if we give them only uh, worksheets. And, and uh, I've also learned a lot from this uh, experience in terms of um, ex exploring um, digital learning in terms of developing a methodology um, that uh, goes beyond what I used to do with children's in, with children, sorry, in classrooms, and um, um, it's also um, uh, methods and and uh, uh, teaching um, processes that I will be using in um, classrooms when students are back in the classrooms. And here are my propositions. The first one is that uh, we need to make sure that our students have synchronized and asynchronized online learning arrangements. Um, I hope this is possible in your context also. So the suggestion is do not only have your, your students in front of you face to face all the time, get them to work in pairs or in small groups um, uh, where um, students meet up without the teacher, but sometimes I join those groups too. And as I said, uh, the parents of my students helped me and helped me enormously with that. With teenagers, I think if we have their um, understanding of, of such things, we can uh, get them to do this themselves. With children, we need parents' initial help. And um, my next um, proposition, uh, proposition number three, would be enrich your classroom teaching. So I'm looking forward to being with uh, my learners again in the classroom. And that means that some of the things I've developed for online learning, I will be using in the classroom. In my case, a buddy learning system, um, um, the recording of student presentations, as I said, this kind of show and tell, the unboxing videos that my grandson loves producing. Um, and um, I will also have uh, body and group speaking phases online. So continuing online with that outside of the normal timetable. That's something, of course, where I need uh, parents again when it comes to the children. And it's something that um, I would initiate uh, with teenagers. Uh, so instead of homework, sometimes teenagers would uh, get a task of meeting up with their learning buddy and doing certain tasks um, that I give them. And I think what I have learned is how important it is to have close contact with uh, 
parents, this is something I would like to recommend too. So here we are. Thanks so much for um, listening. If you're still there, I hope you're there still. And over to Henata. Renata, I cannot hear you anymore. Yeah, they were supposed to unmute me, but they didn't do it. So here I am unmuting myself. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I think that uh, before we start your Q&A session, uh, I have two, two main things to say to our audience. They were asking if, about our webinar, uh, if it is going to be uh, available. Yes, it will be on Cambridge Press uh, YouTube channel. They are also talking about your tip about looking in the eyes, which I'm trying to, to show to them how you do it, like because you have to look at your camera because it's very hard for us. We always are, have mixed feelings, right, Dr. Herbert, yes. about look at the camera, look at Herbert. And also one of uh, one of the someone on chat asked about the certificate. I will talk about it uh, soon. So okay. now, if you for those of you who wrote questions for Dr. Puha on our YouTube or on our chat, it's time. Our crew selected selected a few from for me to ask to you. I'll be the one responsible for give them. Uh, their voice, okay, Dr. Herbert. So please, uh, if I made any wrong question, uh, we can talk with my English teachers. When I was young, I learned a lot. That's why I'm here today, <laughs> so we can complain up with them. But now, Caroline Fonseca from Montes Claros, Minas Gerais, Brazil, asks, how can we motivate students during distance learning? I think that this is a, especially, and she talks about also young learners, teens, and adults. Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much, Caroline, for, for this uh, question. It's an extremely important one. I have given a few hints already in the, in the presentation. The first thing is that uh, what we do with our students it needs to be relevant to our students. That's, that's a key point. We need to actually show our students and also discuss with them that what the, we are doing with them is important and relevant. And, and the problem I have seen um, from, you know, my grandchildren and other children of friends, etc., 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 is, and I'm not talking about their English teachers, okay? Let me stress this. But, but what in this lockdown situation, in this home learning situation, in this home office situation, children often have to do uh things that i think are handed out to them to keep them busy and this uh doesn't really work we need interesting content we need um to have personal contact with our students uh, we need to show them that we are interested in their situation that we are uh, interested in their learning situation we need to show them that we are prepared to help and we need to make absolutely clear to them that what we are doing with them is extremely important, that this is not a holiday situation, but this is a situation that is unavoidable now and that it is their responsibility to actually um, give us their passion for their learning um, because we are doing everything we can as teachers to actually support them there. So I'm sorry if I sound a little bit like a preacher man here, but I think this leads us back to what Earl Stevig said uh, at the beginning and to what Pelé said. It leads us back to the love that we have, to the enthusiasm and passion we have for teaching. And if we have that enthusiasm for teaching, and if we can engage our learners uh, in these kinds of, of chats, then uh, chances are higher. We will not always succeed. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying um, you are 100% responsible for students who are demotivated or unmotivated. We know this is also a given. But the more we believe in it, the more passion we have for this learning, 
the more we can achieve with our students. Perfect, Dr. Heber. Thank you very much. I think that one of the things uh, you said that always remind me about a class I made before it was uh, what is relevant? Huh? And relevant is something that you want to talk about more on it, right? Yeah, so when, right. You were, when you're talking about what is interesting to each uh, children, I think it's what is relevant to them, that question. Yes. We have another question. Okay. This is from ha Raquel Aragon from Salta, Argentina. How can we help our learners to feel they are in control? Wow, that's a thank tough one. <laughs> thank you, Raquel, for this, this question from Salta. That's a place I've already been to. I've given talks in Salta. Um, um, you know, uh, our learners uh, need to feel that they have a res responsibility for uh, their own learning process. And one way of helping them to do that is by um, giving them opportunities where they are in control. We're talking independent learning. learning. We're talking about um, learner-centered learning. We must give, we must not do this too fast. We need to give them uh, responsibilities in the learning process, first of all, in very small steps. So for me, it would be something like, well, I'd like you to do task A and task B. You can decide whether you want to do task B first or task A first. So that's a ridiculous, if you want, uh, question. But it is in, an important one because it's the student who can make a decision. And there are many, many other things you can do. Um, you can give them, when you give them a writing task, you can give them a choice. You can give them a plan for this week. You can also give that to them when you're working with them in class. You give them a plan for a lesson. Today, in this lesson, I want you to work independently. And I want you to do these five things in any order. And you can work together with someone else. I'm at the back of the class. If you want to ask me a question, I'm going to help you. You can do the same thing when you have uh, groups of children, say groups of four, working online. Give them a map, give them a plan of the things you want them to do, and they decide on the on the order. There are many other um, examples, of course, but I'm afraid I can't share them all with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Herbert. I think that we have the, uh, uh, one last question because of time. We have a lot of other questions, but we have this time, the, the time and schedule stuff. Djalma van der Leij asks, how can we engage students into learning English if the reality does not allow them to use English on a daily basis? Yes, thank you. A very good question. Um, I think um, we cannot control their world out, out there. Their world out there is, of course, uh, a world of their own language, of their L1. But what we can do is we can, first of all, make sure, and this is not easy, but it's possible, um, that students talk English with us and with one another in our lessons. We can also ask them to um, use the language when they are learning online with us and with their peers. I've had mothers and fathers sitting in on the lessons, sometimes hiding somewhere so the other kids couldn't see them. And uh, it was fascinating because um, what happened was that um, uh, their sons and their daughters actually were extremely proud that they were taking part in an online learning session. And parents we're proud of that too. So I'm very, very much aware that English is not a reality all the time for them in their, in their home environment. But of course, we must not forget there are 
opportunities for them to use English. Don't forget that the internet is um, a platform where a lot of English is spoken. Can I just mention the unboxing video again that my grandson or the unboxing videos that my grandson watches? They are all in English. And the children play games in English. There's so many things. Uh, songs, music is often in English. So English is much more a reality for students today than it was even only 10 or 20 years ago. Thank you very much for your time with us, Dr. Halbert. Uh, any last words? Because unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been great, you know, uh, to be with you. Thank you all um, for for your lovely comments. Also, I'm now for the first time also looking at your comments, um, and and it's it's great, you know, that that. Uh, you know, at least those of you who, who are making those comments, and it's been a lot of you who've, who've said um, thank you and um, who've enjoyed this session, obviously. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. Um, I think one last important point, uh, and that is um, keep a sense of humor. Um, online teaching is not always easy. You are bound to meet technical glitches uh, there will be problems there are problems on a on a continual basis it's good to breathe and to have a sense of humor um, sometimes and your students will enjoy that too thanks so much um, thank you very bye -bye much to everybody in many countries around the world and in brazil especially thank you so much for joining us and i wish you all the best and hope to see you in person again in the not to distant future. Bye -bye. Oh, I hope to. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. Thank you. Now, I have a few uh, remembers uh, for you guys. Actually, the first ones remember that every year Cambridge Day cooperates with an angel, and this is the part that, that my cat's tail appeared on screams. Hi, Chichi Diza. Oh, I'm walking right now. Thank you very much. So, remember that every year Cambridge Day cooperates with an NGO with your donation. It's the Food for Thought project. Uh, this year is, is Ação Pela Cidadania, which is a renowned NGO in Brazil that fights against hunger and poverty since 1993. Uh, it was uh, founded by Betinho, and nowadays our help is more important than ever. Just use this QR code that appears on your screen to donate and we also will have another clear code. A few of you guys were asking about how uh, you get your certificate. Okay, my cat wants to appear on our on our Cambridge Day 2020. Sorry, but talking about uh, another clear code, our screen has a lot of possibilities. We have another one that will lead you to our survey about your expense uh, about your experience here online on Cambridge Day this year's edition of Cambridge Day and just, just fulfill and download the, the participation certificate let me say it again because I start laughing because of the cat again so you fulfill this survey which is another QR code on your screen will lead you and then you get your certificate uh, so now we have a short break for you to run around your house, scratch, get a glass of water, and we'll be back in about 15 minutes uh, in the link you received in your email. See you soon. <laughs>